Hi everyone, I'm Saman from the University of Washington and today I'm going to talk about our project towards battery-free HD video streaming. As we all know, video cameras today are pervasive and the biggest challenge that they face is their power consumption. So let's look at a few specific applications. So this device is called a Snap Spectacle. Snap Spectacle is a variable camera that people use for applications like video blogging. On each push of a button, Snap Spectacle records a 10-second video snippet and stores that on a local flash memory. However, the challenge that Snap-type kind of devices face is that batteries add weight. In addition, Snap have some kind of heating issues as well. As a result, they cannot support high power consuming operation like video streaming. Another example is Nest Camera. Nest Cameras are used for security and monitoring applications. Nest Camera uses Wi-Fi to stream live video to the user's smartphone. However, due to the high power consumption of live video streaming, Nest Cameras have to be plugged in at all the times, so that limits their location that they can be deployed at. So given this power requirement, here is the grand challenge that we articulate. Can we design sticker form factor battery-free camera tags So if we can do this, then we can have snap spectacles that can stream to a nearby smartphone without the need for any batteries. Similarly, we can have Nest cameras that are battery free and can stream to a nearby hub device without the need for any running wires. The challenge, however, is that video streaming is extremely power hungry. Here are the specific components within a streaming camera device. We have an image sensor, which is an array of photodiode. And then we have an ADC that converts the analog pixels into bits. And then we have digital compression that compresses the video. And finally, we have a communication module that transmit or stream live video. Let's look at the power consumption of each individual block. So the image sensor that captures analog pixels that burns, that is very low power and burns in the order of 80 to 85 microwatts of power. And then ADCs are orders of magnitude more power consuming, talking about few milliwatts of power. Digital compression and communication module are even worse off. Adding all of these power numbers together, we are talking about more than one watts of power, which is far from our budget on the battery-free platform. On battery-free free platform, we are targeting budgets below a milliwatt. So there is about a thousand X sort of gap. So to address this challenge, we take our inspiration from the Great Seal Bach. More than 70 years ago, Russia hid a passive listening device inside a gift that was given to the US Embassy. This listening device is completely passive and had no batteries on it, but the device was a very thin membrane which was resonated when there was a speech nearby. To recover that speech, all they had to do was to basically use an external radio to transmit an RF signal and then listen to the reflected signal from that hearing device. Then they could recover the voice. Building on this completely passive and battery-free design, we introduce our new technique, which is we're going to directly connect the analog pixels into our antenna, skipping all of those intermediate blocks. That would effectively have an antenna that its impedance is modulated by the analog pixels. And then in order to recover that video stream, we can basically have uh, a receiver or a hub device that is basically listening for the backscatter information from the camera. This way, we can achieve a low power video streaming camera architecture. So here are, are our contributions. We showed the first demonstration of analog video backscatter that connects the analog pixel directly to the antenna. We evaluate our system with using multiple prototype and doing a lot of simulation. First, we build an HD prototype that shows we can do HD video streaming, which is 720p video streaming at a distance of up to 14 feet from a hub device. Second, we spec out an IC that shows we can do 30 frames per second HD and full HD video by burning as little as 250 microwatt and 560 microwatt. Finally, we built a live prototype of our system that supports 112 by 112 video stream at a distance of up to 27 feet, which we are going to demo later. 
So we have two, two demos today. The, the first demo is a recorded video from our uh, HD uh, prototype. We ask a user to wear a camera and basically record a video from uh, an activity. Then we push that video into our HD prototype and then we offline process the streamed video. So that video that you are looking at is actually a video that we got through our backscatter, our HD prototype. As you can see, the video quality actually looks pretty high. And then you can use that for a lot of sort of variable and security applications. So while our HD video uh, prototype is not real time now, but we actually built a low resolution 112 by 112 video streaming camera that actually is real time. So it can, does, it, it, it can do 30 frames per second live video streaming. So I'm going to invite Merdot to the stage so he can basically help me run the demo. So before, before going to showing to actual demo, I'm going to basically explain the different sort of components of our demo. So basically, we have a single tone transmitter that transmits an RF signal through the air. And then we have a software-defined radio that is basically receiving backscatter information from the camera. And finally, we have an analog backscatter camera that backscatter video stream live through the air. So let me uh, switch to our demo mode quickly. Let me bring the video frame to the other. Okay. Okay. So you can you can see that I mean first of all video as as I said is low low resolution. Plus it does not do any kind of carrier send to avoid interference. But still you can basically clearly sort of identify the faces or distinguish between the faces on on that low res video. So that that camera is actually burning about a milliwatt of power with uh, commercial off-the-shelf component, and it's just for, for our live sort of demonstration. So from now on, I just uh, want to basically hand it over to Merda, and he will continue. Thanks, Saman. I will continue the presentation uh, starting with the technical challenges. Achieving this architecture in practice requires us to address two main challenges. First, video, analog video is known to have a lower quality than digital video. This is the reason why most analog TV stations switch to digital. To see why this is, here, here is an analog pixel generated by the camera. The wireless channel introduce, introduces noise to the signal. Therefore, what we receive is a noisy image that has a much, more, much lower quality. A digital transmission, in contrast, adds digital coding to deal with the noise and does not have similar degradation. The second challenge is that when we go analog, we lose the benefits of digital compression. This is challenging because a streaming uncompressed HD video on the wireless channel requires more than 200 megabits per second data rate. For full HD, this is more than 500 megabits per second. These data rates are too high in comparison with typical data rates between 10 to 20 megabits per second for a Wi-Fi system. So let's address these two challenges. But first, we're going to see how can we improve the quality of an analog video. We take our inspiration from human's brain, which uses analog signal to send commands. The brain transmits information by sending pulse signals, where information is encoded in the delay between pulses. This representation, in fact, is more resilient to noise. Here is the analog pixels that I showed you earlier. When they go over the channel, noise is introduced, and the received image has lower quality. However, if we encode pixels using pulse width modulation, although the received signal is noisy, we can still clearly see the pulse levels. As a result, we receive higher quality image compared to analog modulated signal. Therefore, we create pulse modulated signal using analog hardware. To put this in a very simple way, we connect the analog output of an image sensor to a comparator. We compare this signal with the triangular wave that we generate. On the output of the comparator, we will receive a pulse width modulated signal. 
At a high level, what we are doing is to map each analog pixel value to a pulse leak signal with a different duration. And by doing this, we can overcome the curse of analog video. Going back to our main two challenges, let's focus on, let's focus on compression. First, I'm going to explain our intra-frame compression algorithm. Instead of doing digital compression, we leverage the we leverage that adjacent pixels in an image are fairly similar. And natural images have a lot of inherent redundancies. So we stream video frames as a serial of analog pixel values in a zigzag manner. As a result, we can reduce the average wireless bandwidth usage. To see the quality of this work, we perform our zigzag technique on 100 HD resolution YouTube videos. Then we, filter, then we filter a stream of video frames to reduce the bandwidth up to where the video quality degradation is negligible according to a video quality evaluation metric called PSNR. On the average, we can reduce bandwidth utilization of an analog backscattered HD video at 30 frames per second 70 times. Now let's, let, let's look at our inter-frame compression algorithm. To do any kind of compression, we need computational capabilities. It should satisfy two requirements. First, it should be in analog domain. And second, it needs to be low power. Averaging operation is something that we can actually implement. Specifically, instead of reading each pixel value individually, we can get an average of nearby pixels. Here, we have an image sensor with four pixels as an example. By connecting each pixel to the switch, we can read each pixel separately. However, by connecting all four switches together, we can get an average value of four pixels. We call this technique super pixel operation, which is low power in nature and, we, and can be done in analog domain. We use this low power super pixel operation to perform inter, inter frame compression algorithm. Specifically, First, we divide the video frame to super pixel regions. I'm going to zoom in on part of the scene to get a better understanding. On the camera, we get average value of each super pixel and we send it to the hub device. The hub device compares new super pixel values with previous super pixel values and requests super pixel regions with significant changes. As a result, instead of sending all pixels, we Camera just transmit pixels of requested super pixel regions. Using, using this technique, we are outsourcing compression to the hub device and reduce bandwidth utilization even further. So let's talk about our implementation. We implement an HD video streaming prototype. Since we don't have access to an HD image sensor with analog output, we downloaded HD YouTube videos and replayed them on a PC as a stream of pixels to a digital to analog converter. Then we connect digital to analog converter to our HD backscatter prototype to perform wireless experiments. In addition, we implement a low resolution video streaming prototype using a gray scale 112 by 112 resolution image sensor, which we showed in the demo earlier. This camera supports analog pixels as well as super pixels. We evaluate our system in three main areas. The quality of received video, compression algorithm, and the power consumption. Let's start with the quality of received video. We use the effective number of bits. We use the effective number of bits metric, which is the number of bits in each pixels that we correctly receive. So if an image is represented in 8 bits per, per pixel, after backscattering the image, ENOP measures the bits that we effectively received per pixel. For example, this is an HD image with 8 bits per pixel representation. We have streamed this image using our HD prototype. The following images are backscattered with our prototype, placed at different distances to the hub device. As you can see, the degradation of image quality is visible to, hu to human eye only when the ENOP is three or less. 
To measure this quantitatively, we plot the effective number of bits as a function of distance between the camera tag and the hub device when we stream HD video at 10 frames per second. As we can see, if we increase the distance, the effective number of bits decreases. However, our results show that we can achieve about 6 effective bits at the distance of 10 feet, which translate to a high quality image. Next, we want to evaluate video quality in mobile scenarios. We asked the participant to, to put our prototype's antenna on his head. Then we asked him to perform different poses while we were recording backscatter videos. On this graph, we showed different poses on x-axis and the effective number of bits on y-axis. We performed this experiment at different poses like standing still, moving to left and right, rotating, talking, and moving up and down. Our results show that we can achieve enough greater than 5 for all different poses. Next, let's focus on our compression algorithm. To evaluate inter-frame compression algorithm, we record multiple videos from a, lab, from a normal lab space. Then we run these videos to our compression algorithm and we use different super pixel sizes. In this plot, we show compression ratio on, on x-axis, and on y-axis, we show peak signal to noise ratio in dB, which is a standard metric for image quality. We vary the super pixel size to be 3 by 3, 5 by 5, and 7 by 7. As you can see, there are two trends here. For each super pixel size, as you increase the compression ratio, the PSNR decreases. And more importantly, as you increase super pixel size, you get higher compression ratio, which is expected. Finally, we're going to evaluate power consumption of our system. To, to do this, we spec out an IC to emulate power consumption of our HD prototype. We design the RF components and implement the remaining components in Verilog. Here, we show the total power consumption for streaming at different frame rates and resolutions. The table shows that the power consumption is much lower than a milliwatt, which is our target. In fact, we are able to reduce the power consumption of HD video streaming at 60 frames per second to be around 320 microwatts, which is more than a thousand times better than existing solutions. To see what these numbers mean in practice, we took an RF power harvester and put it at different distances to a wireless transmitter. We measured the power harvested as a function of distance. Let's map these numbers to power consumption table on previous slide. We can see that we can stream full HD video at 60 frames per second, up to 6 feet. Also, we can stream videos, HD videos up to 12 feet at 30 frames per second. And you can, give it, you can get even longer ranges by reducing either the frame rate or resolution. These results show that our approach is a potential for battery-free video streaming using RF harvesting. Now let's take a step back and go back to the vision that we started with. What we started out with was to design a sticker form factor battery-free camera tag. What we've learned so far is that there is a trade-off between video quality and range. We can stream HD video up to 10 feet, However, we can stream low resolution video in longer ranges. Further, we need to explore more advanced inter-frame compression algorithm if we want to match with the compression achieved by digital systems. Finally, we need to build an ASIC chip that satisfies the sticker form factor and also battery-free requirements of our vision. This is likely to happen in one to two years time frame. With this, we're going to conclude and take any questions.
Jay Lorch, Microsoft Research. This is fantastically cool. This is really that's that's really amazing. I really like the super pixel idea for uh, offloading compression. I was wondering, do you need to average all of the pixels in the super pixel? Could you save a little bit of power and circuitry by just taking five of the seven by seven pixels and averaging just those? So that's actually a great question. So something that we have been looking into in the past was that. Uh, can we basically randomly take a subset of those pixels and then basically measure uh, the average from that? That's definitely something that we would like to basically look into and see uh, what, what the result would, would look like. But in terms of power consumption, uh, the way that people usually design the image sensor, they just leave the entire image sensor on all the time because there's some sort of a startup requirement for each pixel, and plus the image sensor is not the power consuming part, so they just leave that on all the time. So in terms of power consumption, we may not necessarily save uh, that much of sort of power, but on the other hand, because we are averaging less pixels, there are less switching that need to be happen, probably we, we can save some time. Thanks. Hi, really nice work, guys. Uh, David Chu, Google. Um, so I was wondering, uh, I love the live uh, demo, and uh, I noticed, of course, everybody knows it was in uh, black and white. Um, were all of your experimental numbers here for color, black and white? Could you comment about uh, complexity of supporting um, color? Definitely. So that's a great question as well. So uh, all of the result number that we did with our HD prototype, they are in gray scale uh, or black and white sort of uh, images or video, video stream. If you want to do uh, color, uh, obviously the frame rate would basically drop by a factor of three. We can drop it, uh, I mean, at, at least by a factor of two as well with basically interleaving color information. But the frame rate would basically drop if, if you want to do uh, color information. But all of the results are based on gray scale video streaming. Hi, y'all from Twitter. Uh, I have a question about sort of artifacts. Like, uh, because you use compression, are your compression algorithms suspect to certain kind of artifacts or, or patterns that will significantly increase your, say, transmitting power? What's the variance in your transmission in general? I see. Uh, that's a great question. So, well, I mean, looking at the conventional comp compression sort of algorithm, they, they basically start basically looking at basically estimating what's the motion flow of, of the object and once a while to basically compensate for the artifact, they send a full resolution version of the image. So we, we also do that periodically. Uh, every about 80 frames, we send one full resolution version of, of the frame. Uh, in addition, the PSNR metric that actually evaluate our sort of quality of the received video to some extent takes into account this sort of artifact. So if, if the artifacts are a lot, so our PSNR metric basically show a lower number and if and vice versa basically. Thanks, Saman and Merdad. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a really great talk, thank you.